Welcome to the podcast. My name is Father Bill W. I'm an Episcopal priest. I live here in Austin, Texas, and I've had the gift of recovery for uh, just over 50 years now. And um, I worked in the addiction treatment field for many, many years of my life. Later in in my recovery, uh, I kind of stumbled onto the history of AA, had had always been interested in it, and uh, followed through with uh, researching uh, process they called two-way prayer that people used to do in the early days. It came over from the uh, Oxford group, um, and Dr. Bob was a a big fan of it. Anyway, I started studying that stuff, and it just really set my program off in a totally different direction, and uh, I think brought me to find some stuff that uh, I really want to share with people. So we have a website called Two Way Prayer. I hope you'll go and look at it, listen or watch the video that's there. And while you're there, sign up for the newsletter. Um, My job is to kind of, I think, try to get this two way prayer out to as many people as I can. And part of that process is also to kind of go back and look at the the history of AA, uh, some of the deeper roots psychologically, theologically what's really happening in recovery try to make that stuff as available to people as i can so that's what i'm about and uh if you if you like these podcasts do me a favor and um, send them to some other people we want to get this out to as many folks as we can okay enough of that we're into the second episode now on a series i'm doing on harry tebow and tebow was a psychiatrist uh, He was the first psychiatrist to really promote AA to the general public, and he also introduced it to his fellow psychiatrists. And I'm using a book, uh, his collected writings, it's published by Hazelden, and wherever possible, I'll, uh, I'll, if I can find a PDF, a free version of the article that I'm going to be discussing, I'll put it in the show notes, and there is one uh, for this episode, and also a link to the book if you want to have the, the whole thing. This episode is, is focused on surrender. Uh, it's an article that is based on uh, Tebow uh, delivered a paper to the American Psychiatric Association in 1949. His article then appeared in the grapevine, uh, kind of scaled down. And he, he tries to answer two questions. Um, it's kind of the, the big picture. And number one is what is surrender? And then secondly, since he's writing to a bunch of shrinks, how, how does it really fit into the therapeutic process? He's trying to explain this process to them. So I'll try to relate some of Thibault's findings, how they can maybe relate to us. What can we benefit uh, from understanding Thibault's ideas? But I want to relate them to people who are in 12-step recovery. And, uh, and more specifically, what are the unconscious parts of ourselves that are involved in the surrender process? Thibaut, you know, believes that surrender is the key to recovery, and, and he makes this statement in the opening part of his, uh, his article. He says, it's an unconscious event, not willed by the patient, even if he or she should desire to do so. So, I mean, this is so important. This, this is step one. I, I don't think you, you oh, I'm going to sit down. And I'm going to do step one. No, you don't do step one. Step one does us. You know, it happens to us. And that's, that's what, what we're going to try to look at here uh, in this episode. What the heck is going on when step one has its way with us? Thibault doesn't mention William James in his article, um, but his paper, I really believe, builds on William James's description of what is a conversion experience, a psychic change, the kind of thing that happened to Bill Wilson. And uh, James said it could be slow or it could be sudden, but it changes a person very deeply and uh, changes them again at the level of the unconscious mind. I did a a podcast episode on the psychic change only about three or four weeks ago. So I'll put a link to that 
and I encourage you, if you haven't studied that one, uh, go check it out. Uh, and James is uh, early in that uh, in that episode, K- kind of take his uh, statement of conversion experience, psychic change, pull that apart and tease it out. So Thibaut's coming at it uh, quite similarly. So he writes this, he says, I can sum up these changes briefly by saying that a person who has achieved the positive frame of mind, that is his expression for undergoing a surrender, that that person has lost his or her, catch these words, tense, aggressive, demanding, conscience, conscience ridden self. That's our usual, (laughs) that's how we we kind of come in the door. Uh, that feels isolated and at odds with the world. So that's the one side, that's the before, and has become a relaxed, natural, more realistic individual who can dwell in the world on a live and let live basis. That's the after. And it's almost the exact same definition that James uses. You know, before he says we're unhappy, isolated, but afterwards we're changed and and suddenly we are at peace so then Thibault goes on and and he gives a, a case study psychiatrists love to do that you know it's, it's like well here here's an individual we kind of look look at his case his or her case and it's a case that sounds uh it's going to sound real familiar to us although it's uh it's the 1940s when he's writing this article uh 49 and and it is very much a, a middle class white guy uh, alcoholic that he's describing. Uh, so he says he's in his early fifties, successful in business but autocratic. He's he's take charge and run over people. Some of us can relate to that. He's having a troubled home life, uh, but his wife was uh, putting up with it. You know, uh, he doesn't name the guy, of course. Uh, but for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to call him Joe. So Joe comes to uh, the Blythewood Sanitarium, I believe it's in Connecticut, and where Thibault is, is uh, the psychiatrist. And Thibault said that they had a policy there to dry out alcoholics, to try to educate them, not to get them angry, you know, we're very sensitive people, uh, but, but to explain to the alcoholic that he or she was heading for trouble. And if you're a counselor, uh, you may be familiar with what are known as the stages of change. Um, this, this was later than Thibault uh, was writing with that they came about, but it's what he's explaining here, you know, and, and I'll put a link to those uh, in the show notes, the five stages of change that a person goes through. Uh, very basically, uh, they are uh, pre-contemplation, that, that's when you're drinking and but you ain't ready to change at all because you're just loving this stuff all right but then the problems start coming in and then contemplation is the second stage so i'm having problems i'm starting to think about it uh but i think it's a terrible idea to do right now you know i got to get a hold of this thing and i will get a hold of this thing and uh, i'll quit tomorrow you know is the, is the expression we come up with and then again problems building uh, and this stage of change is known as preparation. That's where I'm getting ready to take action. I got to do something. I got to do something. Um, I may not even be fully conscious of it, but uh, and, and I need to do it fairly quickly. Action is number four. That's when I take action. I do something. And I really want to focus a little bit on that's what step three is about. It's the action of surrender. Whether you're there fully or not doesn't matter. You do the act, all right? And that's the way they approached it in in the Oxford group and in early AA. Okay, you ready to change? Let's start with this, you know? Boom, say the words. Uh, So that's the fourth stage, uh, taking the action. Fifth is maintenance, taking steps to assure to sustain the change that has uh, begun. In our case, that would really be steps uh, four through 12. Um, So that's how we approach this uh, change process. So this guy is checking himself in and out of a Blythewood uh, sanitarium where Thibault works. And he quotes 
Joe saying this. It's kind of interesting. He says, I used to like to come here. You didn't always argue with me. I always knew just where you stood and knew I wasn't fooling any of you. We get people who uh, kind of come in and go out, come in and go out. Maybe something at the unconscious level is happening to them. Maybe change is happening to them. Uh, we don't uh, drive them out, say, well, you know, you didn't get it last time. We're very open-minded uh, to people and very, very appreciative of how they're stuck, how they're stuck in their illness. Anyway, after a while, uh, this guy's bouncing back and forth and Tebow says he gets in touch with the family somehow. And uh, Joe's wife is getting fed up and she is about to leave. And she's, she's telling uh, Joe this. And his business associates are getting fed up. And he says they're uh, starting to tell him that, that if you don't do something, uh, we're going to quit. And this is long before there was an intervention process. And uh, most of you, I'm sure, are familiar with that. I've probably done about 100 uh, interventions over my lifetime. Uh, and I don't do them anymore. <laughs> they're a lot of work and, and they take a lot out of you. The, the, the thing was pioneered, the process was pioneered by uh, Dr. Vern Johnson. And Johnson was an Episcopal priest up in the Minnesota area, as am I. Uh, and we Episcopalians seem to have a very high rate of alcoholism. Uh, as a saying you may have heard, wherever four Episcopalians are gathered, you're sure to find a fifth. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, Joe's, Joe's drunk again, comes back to Blythewood intent on uh, maybe another just short stay, and Tebow shocks him. And, and I couldn't help but think of uh, the shock that came to Roland Hazard when he goes back to his doctor expecting the doctor to help. And Tebow says to Joe, uh, I, I can't help you anymore. We're, we're, not, we're not helping you with this. You need to sign yourself in not for three or four or five days, no more detox and off you go. You have to sign yourself in for 30 days and you cannot leave. Here's the paper. Tebow reports the converse, the conversion experience then. This, this is the change that, that Joe is undergoing at this moment. He writes, here's the story of a patient who has been through a conversion experience. His own account of what happened stresses the signing of the card as the turning point in his experience. And I am convinced that he is right. We can sum this man's experience up by saying that after trying to run his own case to his own ruination, he gave up the battle and surrendered to the need for help after which he entered a new state of mind that has enabled him to remain sober. So there's the transformation process. Something happened. Uh, you know, this, this, is, this is old school for most of us. Not, nothing new here. We, we've been through it and we've seen um, hundreds of people go through it themselves. But now Harry puts on his shrink hat, okay? And he wants to know the answer to three important questions. And th those are these three. What qualities were there in Joe's nature that so long resisted help and finally were forced to give in? That's question one. Question two, what were the circumstances that brought about the final act of surrender. And his third is, why does a positive phase follow the surrender experience? So question one, what qualities were there in Joe's nature that so long resisted help and finally were forced to give in? Uh, Harry identifies two, um, and both of them this is important. Both of them are operating at the unconscious level. Joe is not aware of these. 
but they are driving him, okay? And the first, he says, is defiance, and the second is grandiosity. Tackle defiance first. Harry says defiance is a really effective tool for managing anxiety or reality. When reality starts getting too close, when my relation to alcohol or drugs start to change, defiance starts to operate. So at the external level, at the conscious level, stuff is happening. At the unconscious level, stuff is happening too. Harry writes, if you defy a fact and say it is not so, and can succeed in doing so, then unconsciously, you can drink to the day of your death, forever denying the imminence of that fate. This is a real skill we have, and it's part of the illness, you see. Uh, um, and it's he, he's going deeper than just denial. Denial is a part of it, yes. But he's going a, a step below that, that there's an element of defiance of which denial is a part. I found that helpful, I see. He says, defiance is a trustworthy shield against the truth and all its pressures, all right? Another quote, with people who meet reality on this basis, life is always a battle. Whew. I mean, we are at war with whom? With ourselves. There's a battle going on. Uh, so pay attention to the word pressure. So he says, defiance is a trustworthy shield against the truth and all its pressures. It's like the truth is pushing up at me and, and defiance is meeting it. So there's the conscious level, an awareness that maybe I got a problem, but unconsciously, and this is part of the illness, defiance is operating and 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 the two are going going at it all right we'll, we'll come back to that all right uh then the second let's look at the second one now because because these these two things are actually going to work in in tandem with one another the second unconscious trait he says is grandiosity and he says grandiosity persists of an infantile ego never grew up, feelings of omnipotence, godlike status, a demand for gratification of my wishes, usually instantly, and a proneness to interpret frustration as evidence of rejection and lack of love. We are very sensitive people. Say no to me and you've killed me. <laughs> oh, I'm still dealing with that one. When I was uh, studying to be a counselor uh, many, many years ago, um, I once asked a psychologist that uh, was kind of my mentor uh, to recommend a good book to help me understand the mind of the alcoholic and the addict. I, I want to go deep. <laughs> and he said to me, Bill, just go get yourself any good book on child psychology. If you want to understand the alcoholic or the addict, what's going on at the deeper levels, layers of, of, of the unconscious mind, get a good book on child psychology. Oh, that really hurt. You know? But he was right, you know. Uh, and, and, he, and he's got a book uh, or an article on ego factors in Surrender. And I, I, I suspect I'll do that one next. That's the one that I read a hundred times in my first year of sobriety, it helped me a lot because I didn't understand what the heck's going on inside of me. All right, I want to quit drinking. Well, just quit drinking. You know? Well, I can't quit drinking because I've got, I've got pressures coming from uh, underneath at the, at the unconscious level that we're fighting the whole process. And uh, 
in my case, I mean, surrender took a while and uh, some of it's still going on. I don't know that it's ever a fait accompli, that it's over and done with. There's, there's many layers uh, to this denial, the grandiosity, the defiance. So, so he's describing these here and how they work together. This, this is important. He says, the unconscious defiance basically whispers, it's not true that I can't manage my drinking. Watch me. See, that's, that's what's coming at me. While the conscious mind is saying, hey, things are getting worse. Come on, why don't you just admit it? So there's the split. There's the battle. There's the pressure that we're under. And it's building, building, building. And with the unconscious grandiosity, also at work, the grandiosity says, there's nothing I can't master and control. Okay. The conscious facts say, I need help. I just can't admit it. Someone once said the three hardest words for an addict to ever say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You don't have to know. But damn, there's all this pressure inside. I should know this. And I'll look like a fool. I'll look like an idiot if I don't know it. Uh, how many times would I kind of fake it? What you, you know about such as, oh, yeah, I know about that. I didn't know diddly squat about it, you know. But I had a hard time admitting it. Right? This, this is the stuff. It, the, the unconscious is, is, is at work. It's 90% of our mind. We got a little 10% uh, that's the conscious level, 90% that's the unconscious level. Somebody described it well as it's, it's like holding a beach ball under the water. Great big beach ball. Imagine that. Where you're pushing it under. I'm pushing my problems under, and I'm going to, with my conscious mind, hold on to these suckers and keep them down. Yeah, I'm going to quit, you know, and watch what happens. Boom. If I'm not dealing with them, they're going to come deal with me. And they're a hell of a lot bigger than I am, and they're a hell of a lot stronger than I am, and they're going to win. If it's me against my addiction, bet on the addiction. I mean, that's the formula. Me against it. Now, we against it. And God against it. The odds start to change. But if it's me, conscious mind, against unconscious mind, and it's the same mind, <laughs> bet on the unconscious. Thibault writes, the dilemma of the alcoholic is now obvious. The unconscious mind rejects through its capacity for defiance and grandiosity what the conscious mind perceives. Let me read that one again. The dilemma of the alcoholic is now obvious. The unconscious mind rejects through its capacity for defiance and grandiosity what the conscious mind perceives. Hence, he says, realistically, the individual is frightened by his or her drinking, and at the same time is prevented from doing anything about it by the unconscious activity that can and does ignore or override the conscious mind. I'm going to put those uh, statements into the show notes. I, I think they're really important and uh, worth worth kind of kind of studying for a while. So he's putting into language that the big book is also putting into language, but he's putting it in in kind of scientific uh, terminology. I mean, we talk about about uh, what, what step one. You know, it's a physical illness. I'm powerless over alcohol. I'm powerless over drugs but I've got this mental component to my illness too. And for me, that's the unmanageability. It's not the powerlessness. I, I, I get very disturbed when uh, people uh, attribute 
that to being powerless. Uh, I'm powerless over alcohol, like somebody else might be powerless over penicillin. That's fine. You stay the hell away from the penicillin. You know, you stay away from whatever it is you're uh, allergic to, powerless over, unless you're crazy, <laughs> which is what our problem is. There's a part of our mind. That's what, I, that's what they tried to explain to me that first year, which was so difficult. It's a, I said to my sponsor, hey, am I nuts? He said, well, yes, you are. But you're a very special kind of nut, you see? You're nuts when it comes to alcohol and drugs. That's when something else starts becoming operational and takes over your mind. You know? You're no crazier than other people except when it comes to this. That's a different lesson. That's why I get, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not powerless over people, places, and things. That just drives me crazy. Albuquerque never got me drunk. Alberta never got me drunk, you know? Alcohol got me drunk. And if it stays on the shelf, I can walk by it. It's the mind that says, let's go back to it this time it's going to be different this time i can handle it that's the insanity that's the unmanageability and that's why i need some other power to manage my life god i can't manage my life manage it for me that was the one of the oxford group prayers that uh, they were fond of using so that's why wilson used the word unmanageable I'm convinced of that. Can't prove it, but I'm, I'm pretty convinced of it. Anyway, when reality uh, starts to, to strike, uh, when big time problems start to happen, uh, they register in the conscious mind. I have a problem that creates anxiety. Pay attention to that. We always say we're anxious. Why are we anxious? We're anxious because the unconscious and the conscious ain't mixing. You know, and I'm feeling the pressure. I'm anxious like a beach ball makes me anxious. I'm, I'm holding it down, but reality wants to come up. You know, this is why honesty is so important in 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 uh, in in recovery. You know, I've got to get honest to what the hell is happening inside of me. The anxiety dominates. I experience worry, distress, fear, and concern. I have a sincere desire to quit. And how many of us have, have been through this in, in our lives, but at the level of the unconscious mind, uh, what is stirred up levels, layers of defiance and grandiosity. And, and Tebow says some interesting things here. He says, there's generally a lag time before the unconscious forces are mobilized. You know, then slowly, gradually, they begin to take charge. There's less concern about the drinking. I'm, I'm no worse than other people. I can really handle this thing. <laughs> I was just nervous. I, it was a bad episode there. I was under a lot of stress. I, I'll do better this time. Huh? So finally, even the memory, he says, of their acute period of anxiety is swallowed up. I love that phrase. It's swallowed up by the defiance and the grandiosity. The cycle goes on. Uh, and, th and this is when question two comes into the picture. What were the circumstances that brought about the final act of surrender? Thibault notes, Joe's wife was about to leave. His associates were about to quit. There were serious consequences that were about to happen. A crisis was created, now, which is really what you kind of do in an intervention. You're confronted by the, or the key people in your life and they tell them, tell you what it's doing to them, what they see happening to you and what it's doing to them. And these are people who love you, but they can't take it anymore. Then comes the final blow. His shrink says, I can't treat you anymore. And this is an interesting uh, sentence here. He says, he had no place to take his defiance and grandiosity. He had no place to go. That's what, what really happens in an intervention. It's what happens in a surrender. 
there's no place left to go other than step two. <laughs> you know, I can't do this thing. I need help. You know, so so Joe signs the paper. Uh, this, this is Tebow speaking now. The patient signed the card. First, when all Joe's support was withdrawn. Second, when he couldn't in anger defy those who withdrew their support because he knew they had been patient and long suffering. Joe melted. As I said, I've done lots and lots of interventions. Some of them are really tough, but I can't tell you most of them, if, if it's done right, when, when the people who love you share honestly and usually in tears what your drinking or drug use is doing to them, how they're watching you and how they're suffering and how much they love you and want you. What, is, what, what does that do to the person? Most of the people I've done interventions with, they melt. They melt. They think, my God, he's going he's gonna to shout, scream. 90% of the cases, they melt. Many of them say, what took you so long? <laughs> what do you want me to do? And in a good intervention, you, you've made all the arrangements and... Uh, yeah, now let us take charge of you for a while. You know, we're going to get you the help you need. So third, quoting here, when he found himself desperately needing help and had no grandiose ideas left about being able to drink like non-alcoholics, he had neither conscious, excuse me, he had neither unconscious defiance or grandiosity left to fight with he was licked and he both knew it and felt it unquote he both knew it consciously and felt it unconsciously the split was healing there was the beginnings of a coming together this was the surrender and it just happened it happened to him again like i said step one you know you sit there and you write it and they give you, you know, tell me 50 things, this, that, and the other thing. Well, that's very nice. Uh, they used to accuse me when I was doing, uh, when I was being a counselor, I practiced nasal therapy. You know, if, if in the course of doing your first step, you're, you're dripping from your nose and you don't give a damn, well, then step one is happening to you. It's not a mental game. Uh, it's an experiential happening. All right. And it's the coming together of the, of the brokenness, the split that's in me. All right? It's what has to happen. And we're never sure, you know, what those conditions are. I mean, I, I tell this story because it's my favorite one. When I, when I was uh, doing active addiction counseling, I had two guys sitting in group. And uh, one guy was there because he was in an automobile accident and four people, white wiped out a whole family, four people dead. He was drunk driving. And his lawyer said, you better go to treatment, Charlie. And Charlie comes to treatment and he was my patient. All right. And, and sitting next to him is Fred. And Fred checked himself into treatment because he missed his son's birthday party. And Fred had grown up in an alcoholic home. His father's drinking was terrible. He hated it. And he said to his innermost self, my drinking will never hurt my kids. He missed the kid's birthday and he was a puddle. And he checked into treatment. One guy surrendered and one guy did not. And I'm sure you know who was who. The birthday guy surrendered on the spot. He was a puddle. The other guy was still in denial and defiance and... Uh, I don't know that he ever made it. Finally, and interestingly, Thibault uh, tries to answer question number three. And question number three is, why does a positive phase follow the surrender experience? And here, here I think, uh, is where psychiatry can take you just so far. 
Uh, Thibault uh, gives a, a short one paragraph answer to this, but I think it's telling of, of um, his inability to fathom what's happening. So let me read it in full. Thibault says, or writes, hey, now we reach the third question. Why does the positive phase follow? Here we frankly reach speculation. I know the positive phase comes, but not just why. Surrender means cessation of a fight, and cessation of a fight seems logically to be followed by internal peace and quiet. The point seems fairly obvious, he goes on, but why the whole feeling tone switches from negative to positive without all the concomitant changes is not so clear. Nevertheless, despite my inability to explain the phenomenon, there is no question that the changes do take place and that they may be initiated by an act of surrender. Close quote, end of paragraph. Thibault seems incapable of accounting for the joy, for the peace, for the sense of wholeness that comes with surrender. Maybe only a person who has been trapped in addiction or in stuckness of some sort, huh? uh, who really knows what this transition from one condition to the other, from one frame of mind to the other is like, all right? Maybe Harry didn't mention William James in describing the conversion experience he's talking about here because James says much the same thing, but James knows the answer to question number three, why the joy? In his definition, he says the surrender the psychic change, the conversion experience comes about, how? By having a firmer hold on religious realities. It's that step into step two, the beginning of connection, the beginning of the end of isolation. And, 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 and we're not talking religious realities. We're, we're not, we're not, we're not, we're, we're, we're not talking a creed, uh, a set of beliefs. We're not talking that at all. We're saying uh, a foxhole prayer. God, if you exist, help me. And then feeling something happen, feeling a connection happen. And this is spiritual, hey? Uh, a connection to the great reality. I love that line. The big book says the great reality is within and within is where the problem's going on. And this is the beginning of the healing of that problem. It's the beginning of the joining of the unconscious mind with the conscious mind. It's an end to the split and what a relief it is. It's a story that Wilson tells and, and um, I've used it before. It's my favorite story about it. Why it didn't make it into the big book, I do not know. But he says that when Ebby first came to visit him, he's at his home in Brooklyn, Ebby shows up, he's 60 days sober. And that begins Wilson's mind starting to reach out to him that maybe there's an answer. He's moving from hopelessness that he was feeling. He'd been detoxed three times. The doctor had just told his wife, you can give up on this guy. We're about to give up on him. He was, and he was giving up on himself. And then he sees, he sees right in front of him, hope, hope for the hopeless. That, that's what he experienced. Maybe, 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 just maybe. And three weeks later, he has his uh, conversion, white light, hot flash experience. But it started then. It started in the kitchen. It started when he when he saw Ebby and, and, and began to get some hope. Wilson tells the story, he says, it was as if I was in the back of a cave, chained to the wall. He's describing his addiction. I'm chained to the wall. And my, my wife is standing out there and my friends are standing out there. My doctor's standing out there. Everybody said, come out, Bill. Come on out, Bill. Come out of your addiction, Bill. And I can't break free. 
And then Ebby showed up. And Ebby walked into the cave and reached out his hand. And Bill began to feel, this guy knows the way out, where none of those people standing outside do. That was the spark of hope. So maybe, maybe Harry hadn't, uh, couldn't answer that question because he hadn't gone down as far as Joe had gone or Bill Wilson had gone or William James had gone. James was not an alcoholic, but he knew depression like few people did. And, and so when he wrote varieties of religious experience, he was working on himself in, in terms of what is it that happens to people who undergo a surrender process, a psychic change, a change of mind deep enough uh, to transform them. I want to know because I need it. Harry, Harry, I think is brilliant at, at, at putting into words, psychiatric words, scientific words, some of the stuff that's happening to us. I, I think we alcoholics and addicts are really blessed in, in the sense that um, we get to live two lives. Poor old Harry just got one. Uh, and he was pretty good at uh, dissecting our lives, but uh, maybe not so good at transforming his, or maybe his didn't need transforming. I don't know. I do know mine sure as hell did, and probably yours did as well. So there's joy at the other end. There's joy uh, when, when you make the breakthrough. We're going to go through a couple more of, of Harry's writings. Uh, I, I think they are very, they're old, uh, but, you know, alcoholism is old too, and drug addiction is pretty damn old as well. So... Uh, if, if somebody's got insights into uh, the deeper layers of the mind, I think we'll benefit from uh, having him share that uh, with us. I hope this, uh, this was helpful and um, look forward to working through Harry's stuff. As I say, it's really, really helpful to me in my first year of sobriety. And maybe over the last 50 years, I've come to understand more and more of uh, what he meant by growing up and... Uh, what's really at the basis of psychic change and surrender. So hope it helped. Thanks for listening. God bless and keep coming back.